This video was sponsored by Brilliant. I don't know if there's a record, per se, of most avoidable mistakes made throughout your PhD, but the champion has a name and it's Andrew Dotson. In this video, I'm going to walk through a few pretty frustrating mistakes that I've made or have been making throughout my PhD so far. I am entering year five of my PhD in theoretical nuclear physics. Uh, I'm interested in proton structure. I like knowing how you get properties of the proton from the particles that make it up. Specifically, I'm interested in something that's called the D-term, which seems to be related to how things like pressure and shear forces are distributed inside of the proton itself. But in order to be able to describe and understand this kind of physics quantitatively it requires a pretty solid understanding of the language, the tool of the trade, quantum field theory, which is something I had to pick up as I went along. I was doing research before I got to take a course in it, which brings me to my first mistake. When I was a kid and I got my first job at an Italian restaurant, I spent a little over a year as the dishwasher. Didn't really see much opportunity to move up and become like a cook, which I wanted to do because dishwashing sucks. If you're a dishwasher, you're spending all of your time thinking about what you'd rather be doing. So one day, one Saturday evening, I just showed up at the restaurant. I wasn't on the schedule, I didn't clock in, and I just stayed there all night on the line, watching and learning and helping out. And then a week later, I was on the schedule, not as the dishwasher, but as the person who would make the appetizers and the simpler entrees. So at 16, I kind of treated training as this thing you just had to take the initiative to do because why the hell would I get paid to do something that I don't know how to do? That's how 16-year-old me looked at moving up in the restaurant industry, and unfortunately, that's how 25-year-old me looked at learning quantum field theory to do my research. And surprise, surprise, an adult entering their career tends to have a little bit less free time to take initiative than a 16-year-old on summer break, especially since I wasn't putting fried moths into an oven anymore. It was having to catch up on hundreds of pages of necessary theoretical background. So I still sort of felt the same, but I had a research meeting next week, and I felt like if I spent all my time doing the reading, then I wouldn't have anything to show for it come next week. I didn't think that that counted. There definitely was not enough time to do both, so rather than do what I should have done, open page one and pour myself a cup of coffee, or, or better yet, gone to my advisor and asked for some clarification on how I should be budgeting my time between reading and doing research, no, 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 instead I just skipped multiple chapters of Peskin and Schroeder until I got to a section that sort of looked like what I was doing, and yeah, I just kind of flipped around. So because I didn't treat my training, learning QFT as a job, I developed a whole bunch of holes in my knowledge, made a bunch of mistakes in my calculations that I've since then had to double back and painstakingly comb through. So treat your learning as a job. It's time you should be paid for. Your advisor would much rather pay you to learn than pay you to make mistakes where you're not even equipped to figure out why you're wrong once you know that you're wrong. Being wrong is part of the process though. Why not just do that in a more low risk environment, which brings us to today's sponsor, Brilliant. Now, if you don't know, Brilliant is a subscription-based online learning service with dozens and dozens of courses for you to work through, with physics going from classical mechanics to special relativity. You want to learn about light? It can be a polarizing topic, but Brilliant does a great job keeping you engaged with the interactive features that allow you to simulate manipulating variables like the angle of a polarizing filter to see how it affects the intensity of light passing through it. Or fellas, restrooms can be tricky, all I'm going to say. Now, Brilliant's courses aren't just limited to physics. They cover a wide range of areas of STEM, including computer science. Now, you can get started with a free trial by clicking the link in the description or going to brilliant.org slash Andrew Dotson. And the first 200 folks to do so will get an additional 20% discount. So go ahead and check them out. All of you who wish your professors would go through more examples in the class, now you'll have one less thing to worry about. So thanks a lot, Brilliant. Back to the video. There's that old saying, you don't get what you need, you get what you ask for. And I think that there's some truth to that. Now, I've, I've said it multiple times before. I think that there's some utility in letting yourself hit your head against the wall trying to solve a problem. It is not enough for you just to see what works. You've got to find out why certain paths of problem solving lead you to a dead end, why you can't solve the problem that way. That being said, there is a limit to that. 
In grad school, I have stress tested the shit out of this philosophy, and with my research, I really let myself spin my wheels for an unproductive amount of time. And and this p partly happened because I didn't take as much responsibility in making sure that I was having as regular meetings with my advisor as I really needed. I would go about four months at a time, sometimes longer, without having a meeting. And so when I would get stuck on some issue, oftentimes I would just stay stuck. And I sure as hell paid attention to when I dig, when I dug myself out, when I resolved the issue, and I didn't pay enough attention to when that didn't happen. And so I rationalized my situation by saying, damn, this is unconventional, but I know it's making me a more independent researcher, which there's some truth to, but it's four months, man, come on. Weekly or every other weekly meetings is what's normal. I was just, I was just being arrogant. I mean, I wasn't turning down meetings, not that arrogant, but after a few attempts of setting them up, I was like, all right, cool, sink or swim, let's do it. I should have brought my floaties. The only problem was, so I stopped providing that feedback that I needed more help, and so I just started steering myself more off track, combing through pieces of the, the research where the answer just wasn't hiding. Anyways, one day I finally reach out to another professor and I say, hey, if you got some time this week, I'd love to pick your brain. So we set up a Zoom meeting, we talk research for an hour or so, and this crazy thing happens where now we meet almost every week. So I had this bad habit of spending way too much time on something and thinking, well, once I figure it out, it'll all be worth it. But I never tried to establish like a line, a boundary, saying oh, you can work on it for this many hours, and after that, you gotta ask for help. No, instead, I was just, I, I constantly felt like I was really close for months. But now I feel like I'm in such a better spot with my research and giving talks, going to conferences, that I just wish I hadn't wasted so much time waiting to ask for help. And this kind of brings up a secondary point, which is don't be in such a hurry to assume what you really need is just more time on something. Well, what does he need? He needs to have more time. What can we do? Well, I suppose we could try a time transplant. I was ready to think I just needed more time to work on this project. You might think I just need an extension on this homework, give me more time to get it done. But you're not going to any of your professor's office hours. You're not hearing what they think the point of the homework is directly from the source, which would definitely speed up solving the problem and probably help you get it done in that time window where you otherwise think you need this extension. So. I know it's uncomfortable to ask for help, but thinking the answer is always needing more time is a slippery slope. Okay, this next one is particularly frustrating for me because it's a lesson I thought I learned in undergrad only to keep having to learn it in grad school, and that's that you shouldn't move on until you're convinced, and you should be hard to convince. And I think that sounds obvious, but one one thing that contributes to that is say you're devising some test to make sure that your results are reliable. Is that test robust enough? You need to be really critical of these tests that you implement so that they're testing what you think they are. And in that same spirit, just because you know what the right test is to implement doesn't mean you're doing it the right way. So I've had multiple instances of knowing what the test should be, haphazardly throwing it together, thinking, oh, well, this is definitely the test, moving on, and lo and behold, I'm not testing what I think I am. So for example, when I was an undergrad, I had to write a code that solved differential equations. So what I did was I came up with a function, f of x equals x, took derivatives of it, said there's my differential equation, and then had my code solve that one, and oh wow, it had no problem finding out that the function was a straight line. Uh, turns out the physics that we were interested in was a little wiggly, probably would have been better to use uh, a test function that had a little bit more character than a straight line to, to see how it handled stuff like that. Didn't do that, moved on anyways, to part of a code that would now use that differential equation solver. And then down the road, that wasn't giving me very uh, sensible results. But in my mind, I was like, well, it can't come from the differential equation solver. We already tested that one. Turns out the test just wasn't good enough. Now fast forward a few years to grad school, to an older, wiser, and more gray version of myself. I solve problems pretty different than how I did in undergrad. Nowadays, I like to solve my problems kind of in real time by typing them up in LaTeX. I started doing that with my grad homework assignments 
and I just kind of prefer that now. I make less silly mistakes because everything's more legible. I can leave myself little notes for, I'm not really sure about this. These are the assumptions that I'm making and they're coming from this book, that kind of stuff. But I still do make mistakes and oftentimes they happen uh, when I'm really excited. Like I get really excited after like a really long stretch of uh, scratching my head, not making any progress, and then finally seeing some glimmer of an idea. So we were stuck on this calculation not satisfying a really important requirement. At the end of a 50 page calculation, it had to satisfy say A plus B equals C. But what we were finding was a plus B equals C-ish. Then we realized that the issues were probably because we hadn't renormalized the field. Sorry, this is gonna get a little technical for a bit. Usually renormalization results in you helping cancel an infinity in some, time, in some sense. You don't hear too much about it only contributing a finite part. But once we learned that the field strength renormalization can just contribute a finite part, which could then combine with this stuff that's giving us ish instead of C exactly, we were like, oh my God, this is it. This is what we got to do. Now, my advisor and I weren't going to be meeting the following week, so I figured, ah, if I work real hard over the weekend and this next week, then I can crank out this nice polished result to have during our next meeting. So I'm super stoked to have this promising idea to run with. I, I start going through a book, learning how to implement field strength renormalization, apply to everything necessary in my calculation, and to my surprise, it was still wrong. You see, while I was reading about renormalization, the book introduced this template definition of mass renormalization first, which I thought was the full thing because I repeated another mistake, I was just kind of skipping around, and it turns out that wave function renormalization depends on the definition of mass renormalization, so both ended up being wrong. And so I ended up redoing this entire calculation for nothing. Now you might think, oh, at least you had that A plus B equals C condition to know that you were wrong, right? Absolutely. It would still be nice to have a test not at the end of the 50 page calculation though and it turns out there are these things called renormalization conditions that would have told me I was wrong way sooner. And you know what I didn't check? Those. So if there's anything that this mistake has taught me, it's that I should just never be excited again. No, I'm just kidding. It just, I, I know how I get when I'm excited, I get less careful and now I have these little voices go off to nag to say, I know you're excited, it's great when there's hope that you're almost at the end now, but be careful, be thorough. So yeah, it's pretty frustrating making mistakes that you thought you already learned from. Uh, there's more I haven't talked about, there's more I haven't made yet. I've done a couple things right too, now that I think about it. But the point of this channel is to document going from undergrad to PhD and beyond. So that means sharing some of the not so great stuff too sometimes. But huge thanks again to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. Be sure to check the link in the description or go to brilliant.com slash Andrew Dotson for that free trial and discount. Let us know in the comments section what are some mistakes you've made in your academic career that you think other people could learn from. We'll see you there.